Cement. There he is. Good. Um, okay, so I, I was a. Uh, <laughs> I was a postdoc here at, uh, from 91 to 94. And I think it's fair to say that Jeff had an existential impact on my career. Um, so let me explain. I and you gave me gray hair, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my hair. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Would you take that remote control out of Jeff's hand? Is this me or your I think we probably just uh, let this know that we were still here. Okay. Just need that to come on sometime. Yeah, it's going to take us a, a, a few seconds for the projector to warm up again. Sorry. Or you can resume the Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, as I was saying, it was. I think it's, it's fair to say an existential impact on my career because I, I, um, I did my PhD in Cambridge in the late eighties. My advisor was Paul Townsend, and I was working on uh, super membranes and D equals eleven supergravity, and we we're interested in things about to do with Kappa symmetry and central charges and supersymmetry algebras due to brains. And when I came to apply for postdocs, I applied for. 70 or 80 postdoc positions, and um, the number of offers I got was exactly zero. So um, I, was, I was very stressed out by this, and I talked to Paul Townsend, and he said, well, why don't you just, I'll try and get some money, stay on for a little longer, and we'll see what happens. Uh, so he got some money, which was great, and then we did some more work, and I was very keen on this work, and I was very happy doing it. Um, and then I had a great piece of fortune, because my girlfriend, now my wife, Faye Dauker, had a postdoc at Fermilab. So I came to Chicago to give a talk. Um, and I think Jeff probably and Emil probably said you can give a talk because they were aware of the two body problem. Um, and moreover, Jeff was uh, interested in membranes <laughs> and he was interested in these questions. And it's hard to remember, Matt, especially for younger people in the audience, that these things were considered very heretical at the time. Uh, but Jeff was an exception, and because of that visit and that talk, he offered me a job, or the group offered me a job, and I was extremely, extremely grateful for that. Um, we ended up writing, uh, when I arrived, we wrote, uh, started working on uh, broadening our topics, uh, or topics I was interested, uh, working on anyway, which uh, to include uh, magnetic monopoles and S-duality, and um, these again were very heretical, but very interesting. And we ended up writing five papers. These were the titles of the papers. Uh, first one was with Jim Liu, who um, was one of Jeff's students. Dan Waldron was on a couple of those papers, and uh, Tish. So with three of his children on that, I feel well integrated into the family of Jeff Waldron. <laughs> um, and we had a lot of fun uh, doing this. And But this, I, I applied for jobs from Chicago, continuing my career in 93. And that was before the, Jeff, uh, the, the slide that Greg Moore put up of the sexuality, <laughs> it all works. So actually, there's only two or three places in the country, in the US, who were interested in these kinds of things. And I was lucky to get a job in Caltech, and uh, then things progressed. But um, Jeff certainly was uh, very encouraging and supportive, and I learned a huge amount of, from him in doing this joint work together. So thank you, Jeff. Uh, more generally, um, I was very... Um, Influence, strongly influenced by the whole group. Emil also was a strong influence. Um, we used to go for lunch every day and talk about the latest things on the archive. Um, also, uh, Peter Freund was a strong influence, who sadly passed away recently. 
Um, and John Rosner was uh, also a familiar figure at our lunches. And then there was these monumental figures, Nambu and uh, Chandrasekhar, just lurking around in the theory department. So I, I, I remember the, in fact, one thing I do remember in thinking about that time, how much I took all those things for granted. I mean, I did talk to Nambu, I did talk to Chandrasekhar, but you know, why didn't I ask him about Eddington? Uh, you know. <laughs> In any case, so there's something else I should mention from that time, which was very uh, significant, is I. I <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> I, I arrived in May '91, and which is like now in the playoffs were just beginning, and this figure, um, I'm sure you recognise who it is, Michael Jordan, was just in the ascendancy, and it's hard to um, overestimate the impact that. The Bulls had on the whole of the city during that period. <laughs> so for three years I was here as a postdoc, they were winning championship after championship. And um, our lunchtime conversations basically consisted of what was on the archive or what was happening <laughs> <on the city. laughs> and in different orders. And I remember Pierre came once, the uh, first time I met you, I'm pretty sure that this is you. Yeah. And I think you were aware that we were interested in basketball. And I think you're not interested in basketball. <laughs> and you made a little announcement, a little preemptive attempt of uh, getting the conversation off basketball. Something like, I hate basketball, it's these stupid big men just throwing <laughs> balls into hoops and stuff. And then there was a pause, and then Jeff said something like, Oh, but what about those Horace Grant you know, <laughs> defensive figures on that Scotty Pippen does slam <laughs> So some stuff. And that was a very, uh, very happy time uh, yeah, for the city, but also the theory group. We, love, we, all, love, we all love basketball. So, um, yeah, what I want to uh, talk about uh, on the physics side is to do with uh, a topic to do with brains wrapping spindles, and it incorporates actually a, a lot of ideas uh, that Jeff's worked on, in particular orbifolds, uh, brains, black holes, and there's some nice applications to, of anomalies too. So let me first define, oh, uh, sorry, what a, what a um, a spindle is. Spindle is an orbifold, not quite, well, so it's an orbifold, uh, an S2 with uh, orbifold singularities of the north and south pole, and I'll take it to have an azimuthal symmetry, and the orbifold singularities are quantized. So the deficit angles are given by this formula here. So, local, so it's an orbifold in a slightly more general sense than the famous ones of Jeff and Lance and company, where uh, there it's just Rn modified by some discrete group. Here it's a manifold, that's modeled on locally on those orbifold Rn mod gamma. So there's an Rn R2 mod gamma here and R2 mod gamma here, and they're patched together to form this two to form this spin. So the question is: take D3 brains, membranes, and five brains, wrap them on the spindle, what happens? And we want to study that holographically. And this is basically what I've been doing over the uh, pandemic with various subsets of these people here. So let me give you a quick summary, if you don't mark, uh, it's been a long day, and if you don't make it to the end of the talk. Um, so here are some of the sort of highlights. Um, so the first one is that there's an infinite, it provides an infinite set of examples of supersymmetric ADS-CFG, new, new, new classes of examples of ADS-CFG. And you can test that uh, by a, a novel use of anomaly polynomials, which is nice. Another new feature is that supersymmetry, when you put uh, a supersymmetric field theory on a curved manifold, how do you preserve supersymmetry? There's something called the topological twist, which is a very well-known way of preserving supersymmetry. Here, that doesn't work, and you have to preserve supersymmetry in a different way. And I'll mention that a bit later. Uh, the back reacted solutions, so you, wrap, you put the brains on the spindle, they look at the back reaction, back reaction, you get some ADS geometry, and you find the final solution is completely regular. So this orbifold singularity is completely washed out. There's also an interview for the case of M2 brains wrapping spindles, there's an interesting connection with accelerating black holes, very much in the spirit of what Ruth talked about, um, but not electrically charged, magnetically charged accelerating black holes. And then I won't talk about this today, but the reason why I got interested in all of this is that I was interested in this general classes of ADS3 cross M7 solutions and ADS2 cross M9 solutions that preserve supersymmetry. These arise as the near horizon limit of supersymmetric black holes in ADS space. That's one of the motivations for thinking about those. And these M7, M9, in fact, an arbitrary set of geometries in odd dimensions that Naku Kim and I worked out in 2007, have a lot of interesting properties. 
And this spindle story is a subset of that bigger program. So, uh, so I won't say anything more about that, but that's how I got into thinking about this. So let me just remind you about uh, rat brains um, going back to two the year 2000 and a famous paper by Maldusin and Nunes. But before doing that, let's just recall that the basic examples of ADS CFT Maldusina's famous paper, um, we can take D3 brains with flat world volumes. The back reactor geometry is ADS5 cross S5, dual to D equals four, N equals four. So we see a symmetric Young Mills theory. And there's a story, similar story for M5 brains with flat world volumes and M2 brains with flat world volumes associated with those ADS geometries and those field theories. So Melder and Sina and Nunes in 2000 said, well, what happens if we, instead of having flat world volumes, what about the world volume of the brains was R1K cross some compact manifold sigma P? So the first question is, can you preserve supersymmetry? It's not obvious that you can preserve supersymmetry, but you can. Um, and the second thing is that if you wrap, uh, you put the field theory on this, on this space, and then you go to this length scales much bigger than the scale set by this compact manifold, you flow to some infrared dynamics and you get a field theory on this space, it could have different types of dynamics, but you might get conformal dynamics in the infrared. And so if that happens, then you'll get new examples of ADS CFT on this lower dimensional space, space time. So that's the basic idea uh, of Melusina and Nunez back in 2000. So what about preserving supersymmetry? Well, the simplest way of doing that is uh, the so-called topological twist, which goes back to uh, Witten when he was formulating topological field theory. And the idea is very simple. If you want a supersymmetric field theory on this, this space here, um, this space may not have even have a, a spin structure. So you might not be even able to define spinners on there, but the way in which, um, if you have a field theory with an R symmetry, then you'll get a killing, a killing spinner equation, which looks something like this. So this is the usual spin connection, but if it's coupled to some R symmetry currents and the spinner is transforming in some representation of the R symmetry, you'll get some formula like that. And what Witten said is that you can trade off the spin connection with the R symmetry, background R symmetry currents, so they cancel off. And if they cancel off, then we can all solve the final equation. We just have constant spinners on that, on that compact manifold. <clears throat> so that was a beautiful idea, which has had many uh, implementations and repercussions, uh, particularly topological field theory. Pashatsky, Sadov, and Baffer in 95 realized there's a geometric way of thinking about this. And when you take a brain and you wrap a calibrated cycle inside a special holonomy manifold, that's exactly the way supersymmetry is preserved. You wrap a calibrated cycle, supersymmetry is preserved, but if you look at the details, it's exactly preserved in, in this manner. So this is all, all old review. Let me just continue a little bit with the story before we go into the new stuff. So let's take, for example, five brains wrapped on a Riemann surface inside a Calabi R3 fold. So what I'm saying, what I was saying before, is that you should imagine that there's some ADS7 cross S4 solution in the UV, and the world volume, um, the, the sections of this ADS7 are R15, uh, uh, sorry, R13 cross sigma G. And then you flow in the infrared to ADS5 cross Riemann surface. And I use this notation just to indicate that the force sphere is fibered over the Riemann surface. And they constructed this solution. So the infrared is dual to some four dimensional N equals one supersymmetric conformal field. And one thing I'll just emphasize here, I told you that the way in which supersymmetry realizes by this topological twist, and in particular, the spinners are constant, I mentioned that, but there are also chiral, uh, chiral spinners on this room and surface. And moreover, the magnetic mm -hmm. asymmetry flux is the Euler number of the Riemann surface. That's another incarnation of the topological twist. The spin connection is just the asymmetry currents. So the Euler character of the Riemann surface is just 2, 1 minus G. And then actually with uh, other people, but myself, including with Dan Waldrum and collaborators, you can take D3 brains and membranes and wrap them on Riemann surfaces. And you can also take five brains and D3 brains and wrap high, high dimensional cycles in, in color and special holonomy manifolds. And back from 2000 for the last 20 years, this story has been unfolding in various uh, different levels of complexity. 
One particular one which is going to be important is uh, a version involving Sasaki Einstein spaces. So a Sasaki Einstein space is such that, and I'll say a little bit more on the next slide, that the cone is a Calabi-R manifold, so that's a Calabi-R fourfold, that's a Calabi-R threefold. You put either D3 brains or M brains at the apex of that cone, and then you realize a new conformal field theory on these flat slices. And then you could ask the question, what about if I take those conformal field theories and wrap them on a Riemann surface, what happens? And you can play that game, and that game has been played. So here, what I want to do is this story, but wrapping on the world volume of the spindle. So let's take the world volume of these brains at the apex of these calabi out cones, wrap them on the spindle, and what happens? And in a sense, the only way, the only tool we have at the moment really to understand this is holography. So that's what we use. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more or, or remind you about the Psyche Einstein manifolds. As so, I said, so do you, you mean you can't really do any world sheet analysis or world volume analysis? You have to apply only supergravity? So what, we, what I'll do later, in fact, I won't say too much about it, but what you can do is use anomaly polynomials from a field theory point of view to calculate a central charge, assuming that the theory is flowing to an infrared fixed point. And, and you find exact agreement. Oh, okay, so there is some information. There is some information, okay. yeah. But, what, but the existence is, is, is the hard part, yeah. So, John, have you already told us how supersymmetric is preserved? No, definitely not. <laughs> Just check it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, you might, I'm not, I'm, I, I might be glossing over it a bit. I will go over it a bit quickly, but I, I will tell you more of it later. Okay, so a Calabi-L, here's a Calabi-L threefold, and it's a cone, and by definition, and by a cone, I mean the metric is of this form, and by definition, that cross-section of, of the Calabi-L cone is a Psyche Einstein phi. You can give a five-dimensional definition, but this six-dimensional one is, is much, much more appropriate here. Um, and if you put D3 brains at the apex of this cone, then you get this back-reacted ADS5 cross the Psyche Einstein five geometry. The simplest case would be the Psyche Einstein five as a five-sphere, and then this cone actually is just flat R6. Um, there's only five form flux, and that's because there's only D3 brains. And this gives an infinite class of n equals one conformal field theories of four space time dimensions. And a lot's known about this, but I, I don't want to talk about that in this talk. Um, similarly, for in D equals 11, you put the membranes at the apex of this Calabi R fourfold. And you get these back reactor geometries, which are dual to n equals two conformal field theories in D equals three. And again, a special case is when SC is SC seven is the seven sphere. So these field theories both have an R symmetry. So here it's obvious. Well, it's obvious in both cases. There's an R symmetry in the super conformal algebra, and that's a statement about the field theory. That should be reflected somehow geometrically, and that geometrical re reflection is that there's a canonical killing vector in these Sasaki Einstein spaces. And that's the jewel of this asymmetry field theory. So you can think um, that there's, a, there's a, a classification of Sasaki Einstein manifolds, and the regular class will be the ones I'll be interested in this talk, and are the most obvious ones, and that's when that killing vector has closed orbits, so it gives a U1 vibration, and it gives a U1 vibration over a Kähler Einstein manifold. There's a quasi regular class where this is a Kähler Einstein orbifold, and there's an irregular class when it's the orbits of the U1 are not closed, the, the orbits of the killing vector are not closed. But I want to focus on this regular class. So, why didn't you consider the vibrance in the case? They will come later, <coughs> um, if I have time. Um, so the full list of Sasaki Einstein manifolds in this class, well, not surprisingly, this five sphere, it's a U1 vibration over a CP2. There's T11, U1 vibration over CP1 cross CP1, and there's U1 vibrations over del pesos. For D equals seven, there's a, a, a richer class, but here is a, here is a selection. Uh, there's the S7, Q triple one, M32. And just a little uh, technical point, I mean, there are these discrete options for the cases in, in some of the cases, and that will play a, a small little role in a moment. Okay, so we have these ADS cross Sasaki Einstein spaces, then, and they have this U1 vibration over these Kähler Einstein manifolds. 
So what we want to do, or what I want to do or talk about is construct supergravity solutions that start off in the UV, like ADS-5, crystal psyche Einstein-5, and then I'm thinking about uh, replacing the flat world volume of the D3 brains with R1-1 cross sigma, and the same story for the M2 brains. And sigma now is a spindle with these orbital singularities. So how do we do that? Well, this is actually not historically how we did it, but it's the, way, the best way or the simplest way of understanding the solution is you can use a technique of consistent reduction and consistent includes climb reductions. So if you start with type 2b, you can do a reduction, includes climb reduction on Sasaki Einstein 5 down to minimal gauge supergravity. So this was first worked out by Jim Liu and uh, Alex Bushel. And what that means for people who aren't familiar with this is that any solution of this minimal gauge supergravity theory, which I'll write down on the next slide or two, or two any solution of this can be uplifted with a Sasaki Einstein 5 manifold to give you an exact solution of type 2b. So this is not effective field theory, includes climb reduction. It's a statement about exact solutions. And there's a similar story uh, when you go down from D equals 11 on a Sasaki Einstein 7. But let's just think about this, this, this example for a moment. So the solution that I, uh, I want to display is simple enough that I can put it up on this slide. Um, so let me just talk you through it. So this is D3 brains wrapped on a spindle. So as I just said, I want to consider solutions of five dimensional gauge supergravity and later I'll uplift it on the Sasaki Einstein 5. And here is the action for this theory. It's just got an Einstein Hilbert term, a Maxwell kinetic term, a cosmological constant, which I've chosen conveniently, and Chern Simon's term. And the solution is uh, in front of your eyes is, is here. So here's the five dimensional metric. There's an ADS3, and there's a metric of, which is on a spindle. And the metric on the spindle, I've written out here. So it has a coordinate Y and a coordinate Z. And if you look at this, there's a, there's a function Q here, which is appearing here and here. Q is a cubic. And when, when you're at a zero of the cubic, obviously something you have to uh, see what's going on. The metric is independent of Z. So the Z is the azimuthal direction. And then where the zeros of Q correspond to the two poles. So here is, a, here is the cubic. So it depends on one parameter A. For a certain value of A, it has three roots. And we take Y to lie between those two roots. And then the Z direction is a circle direction, which makes this, normally you might think a two sphere, but to make it a two sphere, you'd have to get rid of the conical deficits at this point and this point. And it turns out you can't do, the, you can't do both. But what you can do is you can choose this parameter A such that the conical deficits at these two points are two relatively prime integers, n plus and n minus. <laughs> and it's, it's a little bit of algebra to work this out, but you choose the parameter A in this cubic here to be this funny combination of n plus and minus. You choose the period of the azimuthal direction to be also a function of n plus or minus. And then this thing, if you analyze it, is indeed a spindle with a conical deficits of n plus or minus at, at the north and south pole. So what's happening to the curvature at those points? Um, the curvature... Um, the supergravity breaking down. No, it, and, and it, it's, it's not breaking down. And, and it's, as, as I'll just say in a moment, those singularities are going to disappear when we uplift. So I, I'm pretty sure the curvature, sing, the, I, I have to, I'm not sure if there's a curvature singularity in this lower dimensional space, but that singularity is going to disappear. I, in fact, I don't think there is because locally it's just R, N, mod gamma. Um, so there's maybe a delta function singularity. It's a delta function. That's, that's the answer to that question. So the simplest spindle to imagine is uh, when n minus equals n plus, but that's not very good for this picture. Right, so then there's a covering space, which uh, you get rid of those. So th these are called bad orbifolds, in the fact there's no covering space which you can get rid of those singularities. And if you take n plus and n minus to be one, then it's a two-sphere. And there's actually no two-sphere solutions here. So in fact, n plus and n minus, if you go through, well, you, you can, probably, you can yeah. see it in fact. I mean, this, this becomes zero. No, what happens when only a goes to zero if you take n plus equal n minus yeah but if a goes to zero then you're going to get a double root 
and the solution just breaks out. So, the, so there, there is no two seer solution here. There could have been, and it's been as part of the family, but there isn't. Ruth. Quick question, Jerome. So you're saying this is magnetically <coughs> charged, so that A looks like. A yes, potential. I didn't mention that. But yes. It doesn't look like it needs uh, two different gauge patches. Um, yeah, well, it, it does. It does. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this. So, so in fact, that's that's a subtlety, which is. Yeah, I don't want to get into it, but how do you define new one bundles over orbifolds? Okay, no, that's fine. And th there so is does need there is a, net, a notion of an orbifold bundle, okay. and you do you do need to do that, and it's a subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a nice word. Um, okay, but yeah, thanks. That I didn't mention that there is, the gauge field is this. So if you take its field strength, it's roughly dy dz times some function. So it just lives on this space, and that's the magnetic flux precisely threading through the spindle. So this is dual to a conformal field theory in two dimensions, and if you count the supersymmetry, it has a chiral 0, 0,2. So you can wrap the deep sea on a spindle, but not on a sphere. Exactly. And, and, and realize the CFT in the infrared. Yeah, it'll do something. Okay, and if you work out what that flux is, you get this answer. So in particular, the, well, the, the, this, top, this flux through the spindle is not uh, the Euler character of the spindle. I'll take my word that this is the Euler character of the spindle. And again, if you set n plus and n minus to 1 as a reference point, then chi would be 2. So that looks at least reasonable. So that is the Euler character of a spindle. But the anti-twist, uh, sorry, for the solution I just showed you, you work out this and you get this answer. So the magnetic flux through the spindle is not a topological twist in the sense of Witten and, and company. It's something else. So we call this anti-twist. Um, and now this very surprising fact, well, initially surprising, but very simple in fact, is if you're uplifting the Sasaki Einstein five manifolds I mentioned, the total space is completely smooth. And there's a little subtlety which is which Sasaki Einstein you lift, uplift on depends on what these integers are. So for example, for n plus is two, n minus is these values, you could uplift on S5 mod Z3 and be regular, but if you uplift on these ones, you could be on S5. So, so what's going on here? So first of all, if you think of just the three sphere, the three sphere is a U1 bundle over a two sphere. Three sphere has two U1s. You could, instead of choosing the hot fiber to reduce down to the two sphere, you could take a linear combination of the other two U1s, of the two U1s. And if you do a Kaluts kind of reduction, if you like, but of those two ones, it'll be a vibration over a spindle. So a three sphere as a total space is either a U1 vibration over a two sphere, or it's a U1 bundle over a spindle. If you're interested in that, I've got a slide at the very end of the talk and you can have a look at it. You can, it's just one slide to see all the details. But the only, so there's that point, which is simple. And then the second point is, I told you a Sasaki Einstein 5 manifold was a U1 bundle over a Kähler Einstein manifold. So now we have U1 bundle over Kähler Einstein and spindle. And you just need to make sure it's commensurate to get the whole space to be regular. <clears throat> so that's, that's the construction and the surprise. So you, you start off with a spindle, which you see in this lower dimensional gauge supergravity context, but as a full 2B solution, which is where really you should be thinking, the singularities are gone. And delta function singularity is gone and everything's perfectly regular. It's just perfectly bona fide a um, holography. So, so, so in the full solution, there's no sort of fixed point no, of anything. Is that the point to you? Yeah. So as I said, just if you think of the, the three sphere case, it's li literally the round three sphere. Mm -hmm. But if you choose a non-hot fibered linear combination of two U1s, and then just say that's a vibration over what, you will see that there's conical singularities. So it's a very, very simple action. Sorry, and you mentioned you don't know yet what the 2D CFT is that's stored to the solution? So, it, it, well, it would be whatever the, so in the S5 case, it's n equals 4 yang mills theory, put on the spindle. Right, but is there an explicit description of what that wraps from, from a weak, you know, a weak coupling point of view? Is that what you mean? Uh, no, just what the, the, the gauge theory is on the, on the, the brain. Yeah, so that's a good, I mean, that's a good question. Exactly how should you think about it, uh, the boundary conditions you impose at, at the, the poles and so on. 
So I don't know the answer to that, but there's this indirect calculation, which I was mentioning to Jeff, which was that you can do anomaly polynomial calculations, which somehow is a much more robust kind of calculation, which glosses over all those issues. And that's a good question. Um, it, yeah, and in fact, the full 10-dimensional solution, Dan and I and Naku Kim wrote down in 2006. So we had these solutions, but we didn't appreciate that there were five S five dimensional Sasaki and some manifolds fibered over these spindles. So we had no idea what these field theories were. So in a sense, we've solved a puzzle that we well, we posed in two, back in 2006. And if you calculate the central charge, well, it's a simple calculation from the gravitational solution. And you can rewrite, in fact, we had the central charge back then, but we didn't write it this way, but this is the nice way of writing it. It turns out that it's proportional to the four-dimensional a charge of the this n equals one four-dimensional field theory and then it's uh, modulated if you like by the spindle data this n plus or minus and then the, uh, the statement is that this central charge corresponds to the central charge of the infrared limit of these uh, two-dimensional field theories ar ar arising from this four-dimensional field theory wrapped on the spindle So how do we check, can we check that in any more detail? And this is just a sketch then. So there is a field theory calculation and it rests on uh, the notion of C extremization of two dimensional field theories, uh, supersymmetric and formal field theories, with zero comma two supersymmetry. Benini and Bob have said that the central charge, this is a variation of A maximization in four dimensions, um, but here the two dimensional central charge, um, construct a two dimensional central charge as a function of um, a trial R symmetry. So you have the, all, the, all the abelian symmetries of your field theory, you can construct a central charge as if some linear combination is the R symmetry, and then you extremize over the space of all the, uh, the, the space of the R, possible R symmetries, and the extremal point gives you the central charge of the field theory. So this is a, sort of, a, this has been very well analyzed in many cases. The novelty here, is you have to allow for mixing with the internal symmetry of the spindle. So you take the four dimensional theory, you wrap it on the spindle, but now there's a U1 because we have this, we impose the azimuthal symmetry of the spindle. And there's a mixing between the flavor symmetries of the four dimensional field theory and this azimuthal symmetry on the spindle. Um, and you, so you do that calculation and uh, there was this nice paper by Aristotle Tachikara and Zaffaroni and a generalization of that we, we, we put to this context and well just schematically the r trial central charge is the r charge of the four-dimensional field theory plus a mixing with the j the azimuthal generated the azimuthal symmetry and the extremal point you find epsilon is given by n plus or minus and c during during this calculation is exactly this central charge of, that you get from the gravitation <clears throat> so that's um yeah, that, that's for the D3 brain dropped on a spindle, that's kind of a, a template of the, of, of, the, of the story. Any more questions at this point? It's not about time for can, can you get information about scaling dimensions of operators? Um, yes, you can. So you can, you can wrap for some operators. I mean, we haven't done a lot, but you can take some, um, you can take uh, five brains, and then you can either wrap the spindle in a three cycle inside the Sasaki Einstein, and then you can calculate those, those dimensions. But there's probably more you can calculate, yeah. It looked like when you uh, took the, your, your result for C, if you went to a large uh, spindle number, it looks like this will go to zero. Let's say you take an N plus and N minus goes to zero. So it's cubic, uh, cortic on the bottom and cubic, yeah. So, um, why is that? Uh, yeah, why is that? Now let's say a four d is like order n squared. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's like the volume is getting small. When you're making it more and more conical. Yeah, you, it's there's less. Uh, I, yeah, I mean one thing is of course, yeah, for a, a, for any little n, capital n can be big enough 
to make the supergravity approximation perfectly valid. So that's that's one point. But the feature, general feature you're saying, I, I'm not sure if I have a good explanation for that. But it, it does look like scaling, doesn't it, of some form. Can you say again how you should think about preserved supersymmetry? Like what, what's the form of the asymmetry plants? Do the spindle or that? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's, um, yeah, well, uh, maybe I'll just say one or two words a little bit later, but it's, it's, it's this what we call the anti twist. But let me, let me just, I'm not going to say too much more, but um, I'll say it in a moment, in fact, on the slide. Um, so, so, okay, so one generalization you can do. That everything I talk, talked about was um, for general Sasaki Einstein, but you could take the special case of the five sphere, which is obviously particularly interesting because it's n equals four. <clears> and if you do a dimensional Kaluza Klein reduction on the five sphere, well, you get maximal SO6 gauge supergravity. But in particular, there's a, an STU model with U1 cube gauge supergravity, so that you can construct more solutions with more magnetic fluxes for these U1s. And what that means when you uplift on the five sphere, the five sphere is now fibered over the spindle, but in a more complicated way, because there's three U1s. And you have to take all that into account to see that you're getting uh, a regular manifold. And we, well, we and other people did that at the same time. Um, and the, the main thing I want to point out here is you get this anti-twist construction uh, type solution. And you would have to, because what I said before was a special case of this. But there's a new possibility where the magnetic charge of the R symmetry is, in fact, the Euler character of the spindle. So this topologically is, in fact, the same as the topological twist, in the sense that, well, in the sense the, the total flux, um, the total R symmetry flux is given by the integral of the, of the um, spin connection flux. However, not locally, only globally as an integral. So, the spinners, the preserved spinners for these solutions, they're not constant and they're not chiral. The only remnant of overlap with the topological twist is the spinner, uh, there's a non, the spinner at the North Pole is chiral and it has the same chirality at the South Pole, but in between it's not chiral. For the anti-twist, it's chiral at one pole and anti-chiral at the other pole. So roughly speaking, I would say this is topologically the same as the topological twist, and, and certain people would say, well, that's what we always meant by the topological twist. We just meant the integrated flux, not a local statement. Um, but, but the spinners are not constant and chiral, so it differs that way. But the anti-twist is just different. It has no analog. And then what James Sparks and I and uh, James' student proved earlier this, uh, or late last year, is that, in fact, these two cases are the only possibilities to preserve supersymmetry if you have an azimuthal symmetry. So here's a spindle metric generically, it's got this azimuthal symmetry, and you've got some magnetic flux threading through it. And exactly as Ruth was asking, well, you're going to have to patch this together, and what are you going to do with the North Pole and the South Pole? And, and for it, the final conclusion is very simple, but it took us about 10 pages in this long paper of just building these patches, doing the gauge transformations, and there's things like, the spinners have a particular charge under this azimuthal symmetry, but that charge is gauge dependent. There's, there's various subtleties, and that just gives you a little flavor. But when you go through that, the, the statement is that the only way to put spinners that are charged under their azimuthal symmetry and have a good orbital bundle over the spindle is these two cases. So it's a very robust feature. And that's, of course, what we, we find. And, and moreover, there's examples of both it realized in, in, in particular solutions. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm, it's a theorem, um, and I'll just give you a flavor of some of the ingredients, but it's, it's, not, it's not something you could just put up on one slide. So, is, is a consequence of this that you can't, because T11 wasn't on that list of Sasaki Einstein biomanifolds? That yeah, you, it was on there. Oh, it was on there. Uh, no, but I mean, like, um, um, two maybe two slides. Oh, forward. you mean when I well, wasn't when we yeah. when I went to the S five case? Uh, no, sorry. Um, two, maybe one back, one more back. <laughs> yeah, there it wasn't there. Um, oh, yeah. So I, I just this was just illustrating. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's I mean, there's, there's, there's another statement for T one one. Okay, okay. Yeah, I just I just illustrated for S five. 
Okay, so um, one thing we would like, which we don't have, is a solution that looks like ADS-5 in the UV and ADS-3 cross spindle. So I just told you about these solutions in the infrared, but we don't have the black string solutions, which start off in the UV and go to the infrared. So that, that's an open question, and it would, it would be nice to construct those. Okay, for the last just few minutes, I just want to say something about membranes, and I'm just going to compare and contrast a little bit and highlight a couple of new features when you do the same thing with membranes. It's a very similar story, but there's some new features, and I'll just highlight what those ones are. So we start with D equals 11. We pollute to climb reduced on Sasaki Einstein 7. We get to minimal four-dimensional ga uh, gauge supergravity, exactly the one model that Ruth was talking about yesterday. Um, you can construct ADS-2 cross-spindle solutions. For this theory, the minimal gauge supergravity, there's only anti-twist solutions. Magnetic flux is not equal to the Euler character. You can uplift on the Sasaki Einstein 7 carefully in much the same way, and you get completely regular solutions. Dan and I and Naku Kim had found those in 2006, but we didn't have this perspective. If you take the Sasaki Einstein 7 and replace it with a seven sphere, you, you can now look at a U1 cubed model, sorry, U1 to the fourth model of gauge supergravity, and you find anti twist solutions and twist solutions, and you have to, uh, that, that was done in these papers here. So that's very similar. What are the new features? Well, one new feature is ADS-2 can have rotation, consistent with the ADS-2 symmetries. So there's a metric on ADS-2, and here's my metric on the spindle, and you see now the spindle is fibered over the ADS-2 space, and that's consistent with all the isometries of ADS-2, because that one form, its field strength is the volume form of the ADS-2 space. Space time. So that metric preserves all the isometries of ADS2. So that's a new feature, and you can construct those solutions. You can also construct this UV completion. So now, in other words, it's an ADS4 spindle black hole. It, it looks like ADS4 in the UV with R, R cross spindle slices, and in the infrared, it looks like ADS2 cross spindle. And these are exactly a two-parameter family of supersymmetric, dionic, and rotating accelerating black holes. And they live in this blavatsky demyansky family, which is the family that uh, Ruth was talking about in the electric context. So the acceleration gives rise to conical singularities, as we heard about, and there's a long history of dealing with them. Cosmic strings is, is one way. But here, the statement is, if the, accelerate, if the, if the conical singularities are quantized, and they can be completely removed by uplifting on a seven-dimensional Sasaki Einstein model. So that's a, a, a cute thing. Okay, so just to wrap up then, um, I told you how to wrap D3 brains and membranes on spindles. There's a twist and an anti-twist case are the only ways in which you can preserve supersymmetry. Um, when you uplift on these regular Sasaki Einstein manifolds, the upstairs metric is regular. The orbifold singularities are gone. I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, these solutions fit into this general program and special cases of understanding these much richer classes of solutions. The field, from a field theory point of view, the, the, well, the question was sort of asked, what are the rules for how you should think about quantum fields at these orbifold points? And N equals four young mill series is the obvious place to think about that. I think that's an interesting question. The supergravity suggests that some of these conformal field theories are obstructed. So when you take n equals four and you wrap it, if you take those on a spindle where those numbers weren't commensurate with a five sphere case, it doesn't go to a conformal field theory. So what does it go to? A gap phase or who knows? And, and what's, the, what's the reason? So I, I, at least for n equals four, there's some very concrete physical questions. Um, Samir or someone was asking about five brains and yes, you can do that. So you now you, you play the same game, but in seven dimensional gauge supergravity, and you end up constructing these ADS-5 cross spindle cross S4 solutions, and that dual to a new class of four-dimensional N equals one conformal field theories. For these solutions, we only find twist solutions. There's no anti-twist solutions. Not sure why that is. In this case, this six-dimensional manifold is not smooth. So this is a, a solution of 11-dimensional supergravity with orbifold singularities. 
You can do an anomaly polynomial calculation, match it to field theory. So it's strongly suggestive that these are good backgrounds to look at M theory. But that, that's the evidence. And you could say, well, what are the rules? How should you, how should you really think about that? And I, I don't know what the answer is, but it's indirect evidence that this is a good, and even things like flux quantization are, are, are something. So that's, I think, an opportunity to think about membranes, uh, sorry, D equals 11 supergravity on orbifold backgrounds more generally. I mentioned UV completions. By this, I mean the higher dimensional ADS. For M2 brains, you can do that. But for D3 brains and M5 brains, that hasn't been done, that should be able to be done, perhaps um, <coughs> numerically. Everything I've been talking about has been on two-dimensional orbifolds, but there's a natural question, what about on higher-dimensional orbifolds? And just earlier this year, we had a simple construction, and if you're interested, I can tell you about it, but it's a four it, it sounds complicated, but there's a very simple construction, which is it's M5 brains wrapped on a four-dimensional orbifold, which is a spindle over a spindle, spindle fiber over a spindle. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you can, you can, you can look at the anomaly polynomial of the, of the zero two comma theory, and you can match it exactly to the gravitational solution. So this is an indication that there's just this big new class of wrap brains with high dimensional orbifolds uh, in, in various dimensions to be looked at. So on that uh, note, I just think there'll be lots of interesting things to look forward to. And um, to finish up, I just want to wish Jeff <laughs> 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 Taken on the day, my final day here. So we're still happy. Benini and collaborators have been in the collaborators have considered this black holes inside of ADS4, right? Yeah. From ADS2 mirror, and they had a microscope counting. Yes. And where do your black holes? How do they? And they were also so your. Yes, yeah, so, so, so they have black holes and... which are rotating. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that was so two. This so electrically charged rotating black holes. Were... So these are magnetically charged and not topological twist black holes. So it, it, it's a different. Yeah. But, but is there a? Is it legitimate to ask what is the microstate counting of this? Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. And, I, I, and so which, you, you, uh, which index do they? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, they to? so these top, there's this twisted topological index they, they look at. I think Zaffaroni looked at this first. And so you can calculate the two dimensional Newton constant from these, from the ADS2 near horizon limit. And you get a value which is, is consistent with that. So, so I guess the question is there are three dimensions here in which case? Okay, if not that, is there a three dimensional? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so this would be like starting with ABGM theory, right. and then you'd put it on a, a spindle, calculate topological twists. Uh, sorry, the topological, twist the topological index. And that index is not. Yeah, uh, well, let me see. What do I have? Um, uh, that would be, I mean, that, that, if there's an index no, yeah, that completes this, that would be interesting. Uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm misspeaking. That, that, that case, it, um, it, in the case that it's the Sasaki Einstein seven fibered over a Riemann surface, that's the case. So over a two sphere or Riemann surface of high genus, that case you can you can make the correspondence. But for spindles, you have we that hasn't been done. But there is a, I mean, since it's supersymmetric, presumably it does belong to some. Yeah, there should there, there should be some calculation to do like that exactly. So what, why I was getting confused is, is that you can make that correspondence in the case of this more general, uh, this more general context here. And what I was saying, what, what I was talking about is a special case, but the connection to the twisted topological is, is not for the spindle so far. So the so spindle is a manif the spindles are manifolds that have singularities that are locally orbifold singularities. Exactly. And it sounds like the cases you looked at, those are. ZN or in the AD classification or AN singularities. Are there also spindles that you can play this game with that have DN or E6, E7, E8 singularities? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, so I, I think, yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is. I think 
I, I think in general, the notion of an overfall, it's just simply, it is just a collection of charts where each chart is modeled on those things. Exactly, and, and, they, and it can be discrete groups in any, any of those groups that you just right. mentioned. So in principle, they do exist, but I, I don't know, that, I, for certainly for the exception ones, I don't know if there's any examples. For the D groups, I, I think there's, there won't be spin, so these are spindles with azimuthal symmetry. So it's a very strong restriction, of course, so there's just two points where you can do something. But if you relax that, maybe if it, there's even two dimensional cases. I, I don't know the answer to it. That's a good question. So the shape of the spindle is, is determined by, by supersymmetry? No. It's not. Determined. Well, the metric was, I mean, I, I gave you a gravitational metric, which was the full back rector thing. Topologically, why I said no was that the n plus or minus somehow that's yeah, those yeah, deficit angles. The, actual, the curve that, but, yeah, that is determined. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the metric on the space. So and it's not a constant curvature metric as a as you. In fact, there's no constant curvature metrics on a spindle. Okay, I think we should stop. Yes. Uh, thank what you.